look at disorders of hemostasis. So hemostasis literally means to stop bleeding. And uh, normally it's going to be, uh, you know, mediated through uh, factors that you find that in blood. And its purpose is to, you know, essentially seal off the leakage of blood from a vessel into tissue or into a space. Now, uh, if it occurs abnormally, we might get inappropriate clotting or insufficient clotting. If we have inappropriate clotting, we talk about clotting disorders. And if there's insufficient clotting, those are bleeding disorders. So uh, some of the major players in uh, hemostasis would be things like platelets, which we also call thrombocytes. So uh, thrombocytes are the more commonly used term when we talk about pathophysiology because we'll use words like thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia. And, uh, but you, know, you may have learned about these platelets in anatomy physiology. Now, platelets are these little cellular fragments. They're not even a true cell. This is why thrombocyte is a misnomer because a platelet isn't even a cell. It's just a small packet of a piece of a cell that you know, we say live or basically last eight to nine days in circulation. Now, many of these platelets are actually stored within the spleen and liver, and uh, they can be released when needed or if levels were low. And uh, large fragments of these cells called megakaryocytes become the platelets. And so megakaryocytes you find in bone marrow, they have these little extensions that stick out, and they, they basically just pinch off little pieces of their plasma membrane, and those packets of cells become the platelets or thrombocytes. Now there's a hormone called thrombopoietin, and this actually is going to increase the production of platelets by stimulating megakaryocytes, and thrombopoietin is made by your liver, kidneys, smooth muscle, and bone marrow. Now if you look at a, the structure of a typical platelet, you're going to find that it's going to lack most organelles. You, know, you see a little bit of mitochondria in here. Uh, there's actin and myosin, which really just support the structure of the platelet, but they do play a role with uh, contraction of platelets uh, during hemostasis. hemostasis. Uh, we also find that there are uh, uh, you know, basically uh, microtubules or cytoskeletal elements within platelets as well. They're going to be full of these granules, and these granules contain clotting factors like serotonin and calcium, and uh, platelets also have these glycoprotein spikes that stick on the outside, and these are significant in terms of, uh, you know, uh, basically platelet adhesion to things like collagen fibers uh, when, when there's a wound. So this question here says, all, all but which of the following are true about platelets? You know, A says an enzyme called erythropoietin stimulates their production. B says that there is a made from megakaryocytes. C says they originate from bone marrow. Or D, they're stored in the spleen. So the, which one, the one that's false is the fact that erythropoietin uh, does not stimulate their production. In fact, erythropoietin stimulates the production of red blood cells. That's actually released by the kidneys. Uh, when blood oxygen levels are low, uh, but platelet formation is stimulated by thrombopoietin. We talked about how that's made by uh, your liver and your kidneys and bone marrow. Now, uh, coagulation factors are essentially just chemicals that play a role in the coagulation cascade. So plasma proteins that play a role here um, basically circulate as these inactive procoagulation factors. Most of these are actually synthesized by your liver. And uh, things like von Willebrand factor are made by the megakaryocytes and um, endothelium itself. Uh, calcium we actually consider as a factor four. So although it's an atom, it's also a, one of the factors that, that are part of the clotting cascade. So some of the mediators of hemostasis would be things like, for one, we see a constriction of uh, blood vessels uh, after the rupture of a wound. Uh, for one, this can actually limit the, the uh, loss of blood. But by constricting blood vessels and having vasospasms, you can also create turbulence in blood, which makes it more likely for that blood to clot. We also find that von Willebrand factor on the outside of platelets is involved with adhesion of those platelets to the exposed tissue. And then once those platelets adhere to the exposed tissue through von Willebrand factor, uh, you get degranulation. Remember, those granules are full of uh, clotting factors, right? So we think have things like ADP, thromboxin A2, and calcium, which play a role in uh, the coagulation cascade. So if you look at the coagulation cascade here, essentially you find that there's intrinsic and extrinsic systems. Uh, the intrinsic system uh, is basically comes from blood or vessel injury, and the extrinsic system comes from tissue factor release.
So if blood, or, if blood vessels are ruptured, essentially what happens is that factor 12 is activated and that can, helps to convert factor 11. Now that helps to activate factor 9 and in, in the presence of calcium can help activate something called factor 10. So factor 10 is Hageman factor, and this is actually the commonality between both the ex intrinsic and the extrinsic systems. An activated Hageman factor in the presence of calcium, uh, we call tissue prothrombin activator. And so uh, what this does is actually converts an enzyme called prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Now fibrin is a monomer. But when fibrin is uh, activated, it starts to spontaneously stick together to form a polymer, and you get this fibrin mesh, which actually can um, help to form uh, basically that part of the clot, which red blood cells and platelets get stuck within, so that blood then becomes a solid by making this fibrin polymer. Now, one thing that's important to note is that, see, that calcium is a very common aspect of uh, the clotting cascade. So you need sufficient amount of calcium to uh, promote proper clotting. Now, uh, this scenario here says a man had a stroke and the doctor gave him a tissue plasminogen activator, a TPA. And the question here is why? Like, what is the doctor trying to accomplish by giving this individual tissue plasminogen activator? Well, uh, one of the man's relatives wondered why the doctor didn't give him heparin or warfarin instead, right? Well, uh, remember we talked about how um, plasminogen is, uh, is uh, the uh, inactive precursor to an enzyme called plasmin. And essentially what plasmin does is it breaks down blood clots. It's actually a fibrin digester. So if, why would our doctor give us a fibrin digester if we had a stroke? Well, if it's like an embolic stroke, and that might be due to a blood clot, if you gave that individual an enzyme that breaks down blood clots, then that can help to restore blood flow to the affected brain region, or we call it the penumbra, and that could actually help save some of that brain tissue. Now, uh, uh, one of the man's relatives said, you know, well, why didn't you give him heparin or warfarin? Well, heparin and warfarin act on the clotting cascade, and although these are helpful to prevent blood clots, they won't really have any effect on existing blood clots. So if you had a stroke and then there, and that might be a problem with a blood clot, you know, blocking a particular vessel, uh, plasminogen activator uh, could actually help to break down the existing clot, whereas heparin and warfarin would actually uh, prevent the formation of new clots. So the first condition we'll talk about here is called hypercoagulability. And as it sounds, basically we're talking about how blood could have a tendency to coagulate or clot too easily. And so there's different things that can lead to hypercoagulability. And uh, some of these can actually come from increased platelet function or accelerated coagulation system activity. And so uh, things that could actually increase platelet function could be just the sheer number of platelets. So if we actually have uh, thrombocytosis, which is the excessive production of platelets, that can lead to hypercoagulability. You can see this in blood flow disturbances as well, like if blood flows too slowly or if it's more turbulent, it's more likely to clot that way. Uh, we see too that uh, damage to the endothelium of blood vessels can promote clotting, as well as abnormal platelet aggregation can promote, promote uh, blood clots as well. Now, accelerated coagulation system activity could come from a variety of sources. Uh, for one, we can see that uh, increased procoagulation factors could accelerate you know, coagulation. So if someone actually has too, too much vitamin K or too much calcium in their blood, this could actually promote the formation of clots. Or we might see that there's a decrease in anticoagulation factors, like if someone actually doesn't have enough tissue plasminogen activator, or if for whatever reason they have a disorder where maybe they can't produce normal plasmin to break down the fibrin mesh, then they're more likely to form and sustain blood clots. So here, the question here, true or false? Hypercoagulability states increase risk of thrombus formation. So uh, is an individual going to be at a higher risk for thrombus if they have a hypercoagulability state? True or false? The answer is true, absolutely, right? Hyper meaning uh, over too much. Coagulability means clotting. So hypercoagulability could definitely form thrombi. Remember, thrombi were stationary clots that could dislodge to form emboli that could actually uh, plug vessels throughout your body, like in your lungs or brain. So the platelet disorders can come from a variety of uh, mechanisms. Um, 
Decreases in platelet levels, which we call thrombocytopenia, can come from either decreased production of platelets, increased destruction of platelets, or just platelets being used up in clots. We can also find that sometimes you can have normally uh, you have normal amounts of platelets, but if they're impaired because of uh, maybe sort of um, genetic disorders, uh, you know they might actually not for, uh, function properly. So we have a scenario here. It says a woman with lupus develops breast cancer, and she's given radiation therapy as a result. Now, after radiation, she begins to develop nosebleeds and bruises pretty easily, and her menstrual periods become abnormally heavy. Uh, so the question here is, why does this happen? Like, what does lupus or breast cancer have to do with these problems? Well, you know, she already had lupus, um, and that autoimmune disorder can lead to a variety of, of issues we'll talk about later. Um, but, you know, the radiation therapy was, was aimed at treating her breast cancer. Now, the thing about radiation is that radiation is one of the forms of cell injury, right? And so that uh, if this affects bone marrow, like bone marrow in the sternum or the humerus or elsewhere, uh, it's possible then that she may actually end up having underproduction of platelets, right? And so that radiation therapy can lead to things like thrombocytopenia, where you have low numbers of platelets, and this would explain like the nosebleeds and bruising because of, um, you know, it's going to be easier to bleed and harder to clot that way. And then the menstrual period is going to be abnormally heavy as well because of the fact that she'll have difficulty forming uh, clots properly. Now, um, some of the enzymes that are involved in the clotting cascade include uh, COX-1 and COX-2. Um, we, we have this molecule called arachidonic acid, and this actually comes from your plasma membrane. And so COX-1 actually is an enzyme that catalyzes the production of a molecule called thromboxin A2. COX-2 uh, catalyzes the production of, of another one called prostacyclin. Now these are both involved with the inflammatory cascade. And so that aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, drugs inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. Now th because these also play a role with clotting, we find then that aspirin could be used to you know, prevent pain and inflammation, but can also be used as a blood thinner. And it kind of makes sense because this is actually the common pathway between inflammation and blood clotting. The thrombroxane 2 and prostacyclin are both associated with blood clots. So that aspirin could be used to you know, limit inflammation while at the same time preventing blood clots from forming. Now blood thinner is just sort of a misnomer, right? So you might wonder, well, why is blood thinner not the best description of what aspirin does? Well, aspirin doesn't literally make your blood more thin, right? To be more thin would be to, su to suggest that it's more or less viscous, right? So you might have more water, less cells, and it flows more easily. And that's not what aspirin does. Actually, aspirin, by inhibiting COX-1 and COX-2 pathways, uh, you're essentially uh, limiting the ability to form clots or preventing blood clots from forming. And so in that regard, then it's going to make blood appear more thin because if you have a wound, it's going to be easier to bleed, right? And it doesn't literally thin out your blood, it's just sort of a, a misconception about what aspirin does to your blood. But really aspirin just preventing blood clots from forming. So uh, what is the effect of von Willebrand disease on platelets? Well, remember we talked about how von Willebrand factor was found on the surface of platelets. So if there's a disease called von Willebrand disease, you know, uh, what is the effect on platelets? Do you find that there's an increase in platelet adhesion, a decrease in platelet adhesion? an increase in platelet formation or a decrease in platelet formation. Well, remember, this von Willebrand factor is found on the outer surface of platelets, so it probably has nothing to do with their formation, and it's going to affect something with adhesion. So what we find then is that von Willebrand disease leads to a decrease in platelet adhesion. And uh, this is actually one of the more common uh, bleeding disorders that of, you know, sort of a genetic disorder, so it's actually heritable. And it's caused by a deficiency or a defect in this von Willebrand factor, which carries a clotting factor. And uh, this actually leads to the inability of, cl of clots because platelets can't stick to that exposed collagen as well and therefore uh, you know, have difficulty initiating that clotting cascade in that regard. Now, there's, there's another disorder called disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. And DIC is an interesting mix of bleeding and clotting simultaneously. And so DIC can come from uh, tissue injury, 
And, and both with tissue injury, what we find then is that we have intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. If you remember, intrinsic pathway is going to affect uh, blood and blood vessels. That, that can come from like endothelial injury. And then the extrinsic pathway is actually caused by tissue injury that maybe doesn't affect blood vessels directly, um, but leads to the release of tissue factors. So some examples of like uh, endothelial injury could be things like burns, gram-negative sepsis, uh, hypoxia, acidosis, shock, or vasculitis. And then extrinsic pathway or tissue injury could just come from direct trauma, obstetric complications, or complications of cancer. Now, in both pathways, remember we talked about how there's a common factor, which was Hageman factor, that led to the production of thrombin or thrombi. And thrombi is just basically a clot, right? Now, uh, these clots essentially consume platelets. And they also activate plasminogen because part of the clotting cascade is to initiate the enzyme that helps to break down the clot itself. And this prevents the clot from getting too big. But we also find that these thrombi can deposit within blood vessels. So here's the weird part with disseminated intravascular coagulation. It's essentially we have so much thrombin generation that we've used up our platelets, we've activated a tremendous amount of plasminogen, and we've actually deposited a lot of, of blood clots in a vessel causing thrombosis, right? Which can lead to a tissue ischemia. But we've also activated so much of this plasmin that we start to break down the blood clot, which can lead to bleeding. And we've actually used up so much of our platelets and other tissue factors that you can actually have widespread bleeding and clotting occurring at the same time. Imagine having a wound that's so large, you've used up all of your clotting factors and you used up all of your platelets here so that you just, just keep bleeding. And so essentially how you would repair or kind of reverse DIC would, uh, for one, help to reintroduce more clotting factors. Two, get rid of the cause of, of trauma or stress, right? And so we, we actually would need to, to repair, you know, sort of on either side here, the intrinsic or extrinsic pathways. But remember, DIC is kind of this interesting interplay between clotting and bleeding that occurs simultaneously, but it's when you have, uh, you know, overactivation of this clotting cascade. So uh, last question here says, true or false, platelet disorders are bleeding disorders. And we've learned that that's true because the platelet's job is to clot. And if these platelets are just, you know, if they have a disorder, it means that they're not doing that job. So the inability to clot leads to bleeding. And so platelet disorders, there's a lot of them. We talked about von Willebrand disease. Uh, that's an example of a bleeding disorder.